thank you very much for that excessively kind introduction. I wish you'd introduce me as a bit of a dud and then people would be pleasantly surprised instead of being disappointed that it awaits you. Uh, when Matt asked me to talk about the history of property rights, my initial thought was we used to have them, now we don't. And then I figured, well, he's probably not flying me all the way to Calgary to say that. The story is a little more complicated. Basically, we didn't have them, then we got them, then we lost them. Even that, I imagine, would stand a little elaboration, and that is what I'm going to try to provide for you today. The starting point of this, and some of you, if you were at a previous one of these events, has heard me talk in more detail about what property rights are, that they start with the notion of self-ownership, that you own your own mind and body, that you own your own time and effort, and therefore, by extension, you own the things you make with your time and effort, provided that you have not employed force or fraud along the way in acquiring the raw materials or, or in any other way. And, of course, if you believe in this, then you naturally enough uh, must also believe in, in freedom of contract. This is part of the bundle. If you own your body, you can make decisions about what to do with it, at what price to sell your labor, under what conditions you're willing to work, and so on, and so on. All of these things derive from this fundamental notion of self-ownership, and unless you're prepared to deny that premise, and since 1865 there hasn't been much of that in the world, Everybody is committed to the notion that people have property rights in some abstract and theoretical moral sense. You know, and occasionally you get these weird romantic arguments that until the bad Western people came along, the indigenous people somewhere in the world didn't have property rights, they didn't have greed, they didn't have selfishness, they lived in the Garden of Eden until the, until the snake arrived. But this, I think, is simply fantasy. This mayum and tayum, uh is fundamental, and in fact, Brian Lee Crowley, who will be speaking later, put this point as well, I think, as anybody could, in his book, The Road to Equity, he said, can anyone seriously contend that the maker of a West Coast copper or a birch canoe or a buckskin jacket would not have fought to prevent someone from taking it for their use without his or her consent? Can it seriously be suggested that their neighbors would not have come to their aid? Yet on what basis could such resistance be justified except by the notion that one owns what results from mixing with one's labor with the fruits of nature? And yeah, I, I think the idea that, say, North American Aboriginals didn't know who owned what is silly. You don't spend a whole day making an arrow in order to have some yachts take it, fire it clumsily into a tree and break it. This is just not on. And this is, in some sense, is true everywhere in the world even today. Hernando Soto, who's a classical liberal advocate of third world modernization, places enormous emphasis on property. And he had a story about going to Indonesia, because the Indonesian government wanted to ask him, how do we, how do, we do this? And he said, and they said to him, you know, 92% of Indonesians own, ha, live in houses, but we don't know who owns them, so we don't know how to assign title. Having not paid careful attention to the legal framework, we now find ourselves in a baffling mess. And how can we give people title to their cars, their machines, their office buildings? How do we know who owns what? And De Soto said, well, while I've been in Indonesia, I went to Bali, and I noticed that um, you walk everywhere in Bali, and every time you cross a property line, the dogs bark. So the dogs know who owns what. And I figure if the dogs know it, there's not much excuse for us not knowing it. I mean, and you get this uh, French anarchist, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who angrily in 1840 said, property is theft. And I just would love to travel back in time and help myself to his lunch or his coat on a cold day and see whether he really believed that. But the idea that in some sense everybody knows about property is by no means the same as saying everybody actually has property rights. That, in fact, the story of possession and firming up of, and then deterioration of property rights is quite a complicated one. And it starts with the fact that although in a state of nature people understand property rights, and you know, every Indian band has some feeling, they may have differences in the technicalities of the law, but everybody knows that mine is mine and yours is yours, and we're all committed within the group to enforcing the rules. The problem, of course, is that the group is quite small and the group is quite fragile. And in the state of nature, possession of property rights and practice is insecure. So people combine into governments for the precise purposes, John Locke says, of, of acquiring title of their property. And uh, Henry Sumner Main once said that, that nobody is at liberty to attack several property and to say that he values civilization. The history of the two cannot be disentangled. 
That is to say that securing property rights is not only the goal, but in some sense it's the means of creating civilization. The problem, though, and this is where it starts to fall apart in recent times, something Hayek said in the fatal conceit. It would seem that no advanced civilization has yet developed without a government, which saw as its chief aim the protection of private property. But, again and again, the further evolution and growth to which this gave rise was halted by strong government. And so, in some ways, you get a self-defeating process. As we develop a government strong enough to protect our property, we get a government strong enough to take it. And increasingly, the mechanisms devised to make sure it didn't take it have broken down. So, I was thinking when I was preparing this talk, by the way, there's nothing like explaining something to have to think your way through it. It has been very instructive to ponder how all this works and try to put it together. Because there's a big distinction between de facto and de jure property rights, what people say you have and what you really have. Uh, and it's important to have a government that formally grants you property rights, and it's important to have a government that keeps its word. But before anything else, you need to have a government that actually can keep any promise that it gives you. I was at a, an event where it was a, uh, people were trying to quantify property rights. You know, among those people who believe in classical liberalism and in free market economics, some have a fondness for mathematics that I frankly do not entirely share. And so they were trying to rank Canada among the nations of the world, and who gets 2.7, and who gets 3.8, and who's way up at 7.8, or even gets to 7.9 due to some change in the tax code. And I remember thinking, how would you compare and rank Russia under Ivan III, Spain in the middle of the 19th century, Spain today, Canada at the time of Confederation, Nigeria in 1500, and Nigeria in the present day? or for that matter, Britain in the 9th century. You know, we're going to need a logarithmic scale. Obviously, we're not, we're not all bunched together. If we rank all these people between 5.1, like Olympic scores, you know, everybody's in the non, between 8.8 .8 and 9.4, uh, you're missing the fact that there are spectacularly enormous and multidimensional differences between all of these things. And you have to start with Hobbes' insight, I'm not a huge fan of Hobbes, but you had a point here, that in a state of nature, life is liable to be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And that the reason we combine into governments, again, among libertarians, there tends to be a considerable hostility to government, in which, much of which is justified. I spend much of my professional career complaining about government. Uh, and people tend to regard government as a major threat to property, and we're lucky today in that that is true. But it was not always true. And the first duty of government, and the reason people create government, is that without government, nobody has any security in any of their rights at all. Uh, the Romans rem remembered this story. Going way back into 390 BC, Rome is attacked by the Gauls, led by Brennus here. And they take all of the cities at the Capitoline Hill, and it's besieged, and finally they make a deal with Brennus that he'll go away for a thousand pounds of gold. And they get on the scales, and the Romans put their gold on the scale, and the scale is rigged. And they say, hey, this is a dishonest scale. Brennus throws his sword down on the other side of the balance and says, why rigged this? Woe to the conquered. So you better be in control of your own affairs if you want there to be any rules that matter at all. Uh, and so in this sense, property rights have existed from time immemorial in, you know, they probably existed before the end of the last glaciation, although naturally we have no records. They certainly existed in Rome when it was strong enough to keep Brennus a long way away, although uh, in an imperfect form. They exist in the Dark Ages, but uh, in, in Rome, there's this very famous story in Acts, in the New Testament, where Paul has been the subject of uh, considerable criticism from the Jewish community in Jerusalem, and the Romans grab him and are about to beat the stuffing out of him, and he goes, what do you think you're doing? I'm a Roman citizen. He was from Anasum, and they go, really? And he says, yes, I'm a Roman citizen. And they go, ah, take the chains off, quick. We can't beat this guy up, and they send him off to Rome. By the time he gets to Rome, nobody can remember what the case is about, apparently, and he just goes around preaching in Rome. Eventually, they decide to kill him, but <laughs> on unrelated grounds. But this idea that 
there is a rule of law and they were capable of enforcing it is an extremely important one. And what happens in late Rome, of course, as the empire disintegrates for all kinds of reasons, other political problems they didn't solve, is that this falls apart. There's actually a statement by that great political philosopher and sage, uh, Louis Lamour, that even during the dark days of Nero and Caligula, the Roman Empire was governed well. The terrors they brought were largely spent on their associates at court. The administration in the provinces was only slightly affected, if at all. Which is an interesting insight into Rome. Rome had significant problems in its constitution and governance, and in the end, these problems contribute to its inability to keep back the barbarian hordes. But within the empire, at a low level, among ordinary people, there actually is a considerable surprising security of rights. And again, defense included, unless, of course, you're a slave. But the Romans have courts to deal with the question if you are a slave. They have legal procedures, and they actually follow them. And uh, one story that I do not get tired of, when the Roman Empire is finally collapsed in 410 AD, the Romans withdraw the legions from Britain. Britain's been a considerable drain on their military resources. About a tenth of the entire Roman army is in Britain, trying to keep my ancestors from destroying everything. And when they withdraw, the Romanized Britons get together in a council, and they do something rather extraordinary. They decide we've got to organize for our defense against the Saxons. And they send a letter to the emperor. And they say, dear emperor, we notice that the legions have left. We are feeling concern over this point. Uh, we thought we might take the, our affairs into our own hands, since you seem to have fled. Uh, and by the way, we thought we'd get rid of your law that free men cannot carry arms, except when traveling or hunting. How do you feel about this? And the emperor writes back and says, Good luck with the barbarian hordes. I have issues of my own. See you later. But it's an extraordinary and lawful act. The Britons would write to the emperor discussing their proposal to modify the law to deal with the emergency. And this is a very lawful people here, although they're promptly overwhelmed. And, you know, you get into the Dark Ages, and legal remedies are not important. When the Danes are dragging you naked from your burning house, there's no point summoning your lawyer. He's dead on the ground beside you. You see him in the middle of blood. And this is, you know, it starts out with the Saxons doing this. So the Saxons show up their extremely bad use, but they very quickly get turned into the lawful people. One of the odd little miracles of history. How do the Saxons turn from the barbarian hordes into Christian guardians of order? This is not a story that I can tell at great length here, but it is undoubted that it happens by the time we get to Alfred the Great. And those of you who've heard my lost legacy of liberty speech know that I want a statue of Alfred on Parliament Hill, King of Wessex in the depth of the Dark Ages, a model of good government. And if you don't know the story of Alfred the Cakes, you should look it up, but I won't tell it here. But Alfred somehow rallies his men, defeats the Danes, recaptures London, forces the Danish king to convert to Christianity, and then... In, as an adult, he teaches himself Latin because he thinks that learning has fallen into disrepair in his kingdom and he wants to translate important books into Anglo-Saxon so they can be read. And these statues of Alfred, which they have in England, of course, the sword is important because he defeats the Danes and restores order, but he's holding it up as a cross because the concept of a moral order incarnated in law, and in the other one he's holding a scroll, the emblem of the law. Alfred is the lawgiver. He is the man who respects the rights of the ordinary people and sees to it that they are, in fact, protected in practice. Among his other great accomplishments, when he's not busy with all of this, not an idle chap, he reorganizes the navy to try and fend off the new wave of Viking barbarians. Uh, when the American Revolution happens and the founding fathers scrape together four ships to take on the British navy, which is by this point down to its last 250 first-class men of war thereabouts, they made their flagship the Alfred for Alfred the Great. So this is a story that matters to them. And what you see in Anglo-Saxon England, when it is possible to prevent the Vikings and the Danes from burning everything that they can't carry off, they are a litigious people. Daniel Hannon talks about this in his book, Inventing Freedom, that it's extraordinary, looking at the written records of the Anglo-Saxons, just how prone they are to legal action. A great deal of their time is taking up writing legal codes, some in the form of royal degree, decrees, other as restatements of inherited rights, and engaging in legal disputes over things. The, lo the lords in Saxon England do not have absolute power on their estates. The Dark Ages have a bad reputation, not entirely undeserved, but 
there, in England in particular, it's such an odd place that uh, at one point Daniel Hannon cites this case of Queen Edith. She's the widow of Edward the Confessor, really the last effective Anglo-Saxon king of William the Conqueror, written to a court in, in Somerset asking for a just ruling, considering a guy to whom she entrusted her horses who has not paid the rent for six years. It is very hard to imagine a queen in France, never mind Persia or China, having to petition a court saying, I have had my rent withheld and I need you to give me a just verdict. There were other solutions in other parts of the world. But this is an extraordinary story and I emphasize it only really exists in England and to a lesser extent in the rest of medieval Europe, in the inheritors of the Roman tradition, where there is a functioning legal system. And functioning is a critical word. There are legal rights of various sorts in all kinds of places in the world. But the problem is, can you get what it says on paper to happen in practice, even if you're not busy with Genghis Khan? The English legal code is quite a remarkable one in several important respects. It's the common law, the tradition that we have everywhere except in Quebec, where I think the, the civil law as in France has been considerably influenced by the English example. I think French law, like French government, would be enormously worse if they weren't afraid of being jeered at from across the channel if they didn't get it partly right. The, the power of example is quite impressive here. But the, the common law, again, Daniel Hannon says, is based on the notion that Anything not expressly prohibited is legal. And this traces back, both as a formal way of reasoning and as a folk way, to the notion of property rights. You own yourself, you own your time and labor. Therefore, you can do anything which there is not some good reason for prohibiting. You don't go around asking permission to do ordinary things in Anglo-Saxon England. You don't need to. The law says you don't. It intuitively embodies property rights, and it intuitively embodies property rights because, among its other fine qualities, it comes from the people. See, if you talk about law, we need a law. There ought to be a law. Oh, darn, who passed this law? You know, whatever your view of particular law, where does law come from? Well, everybody knows that. It law is passed by legislators, increasingly these days at the behest of politicians and bureaucrats who force them to pass ominous bills they haven't even read. But this is where law comes from, or else the law allows regulators to make rules, but it all comes through a legislature. But in Anglo-Saxon England, and in fact in Norman England, until the very latter part of the 13th century, there's no such thing as a legislature. So where does England get its law? How is it that England has this impressive body of law built on the notion that you're allowed to do anything just about as long as voluntary consent is involved? protecting the right of contract, protecting property, forcing the queen to go to court if she wants someone to give back a horse instead of just seizing it because she's the queen. It comes from the people. It rises up from the community. It is that set of rules under which we have always agreed to be governed, and without which we will not give our consent to the rulers, and we don't just mean that in a theoretical sense. And this is quite extraordinary. We are going, at some point, I promise to get to Magna Carta. But when we do, we are going to come up with those fundamental statute-like objects, a statement of liberty, which as late as Winston Churchill still seems to be the foundation of the rule of law in the Anglosphere, that is not a piece of legislation. And yet it expresses the will of the people. When the Americans in 1789 create a constitution that says, we the people, they're not innovating. They are trying to stop innovation. They're trying to prevent the king from revolutionizing the system under which they have been governed from time immemorial. Now, I don't want to get hysterical about this here. Uh, William the Conqueror, who is, uh, when he is, takes over England, this rather dubious claim to the throne that he puts forward, clearly an important part of William's claim is that the people who didn't agree with it lie dead on the field at Hastings. And uh, when there is a revolt in northern England against William in the latter part, 1069, uh, William, pardon me, here, harrows the north. There is a severe devastation of, in the area around York that is so bad that 50 years later, basically, 
it's a wasteland. And the king can do this in some sense every bit as much as uh, Genghis Khan or anybody else could have done. Except this is an aberration. When William becomes king, he promises he will observe the laws of Edward the Confessor. The laws of Edward the Confessor, the old last Anglo-Saxon king, are thought to derive from the laws of Alfred the Great. And although clearly there is some discontinuity in specifics, in spirit and in tone, it's actually true. And William cannot assume the crown, despite his ability to carry out this kind of oppression, if he is confronted with a military threat. He cannot govern the country unless he promises to obey these laws and actually does it. And you know, I, I don't want to overgeneralize this here. On, on the plus side, the Normans get rid of slavery. There's still slavery in Anglo-Saxon England. The Normans get rid of it quite quickly, uh, which is a major step forward for property rights. You know, if you, if you own yourself, someone else can't own you. This is not a complicated thought. Those can be a complicated political puzzle. And the effort to restrain the power of the crown, particularly when it comes to powerful people, is a long and troubled one. Edward Cook, who's another device that I would like to see a statue of on Parliament Hill, is a heroic figure in the late Tudor and early Stuart period. He is Speaker of the House of Commons under Elizabeth I, then he's Attorney General. He is subsequently head of the civil and then the criminal court under James I, then he's a political prisoner under James I because he keeps sassing the king, and then he winds up a leader of the parliamentary opposition at the very end of James's reign in the early days of, of Charles I. And at one point in his writings, he says that there is no torture in England. And yet, as Attorney General, he actually signed off on torturing people. So it's a little complicated there. But really, if you want to get tortured in England, it's important to be a powerful person and to be involved in intrigues at court. For ordinary people, by and large, it cannot happen. And it cannot happen not only because the law essentially says it cannot happen, but because the law in England actually means what it says. That it really is operative in a complicated and procedural way. There is a maxim in English law, no right without a remedy. And this can sound like a cynical maxim, like if there isn't something in the law book, then you're out of luck, Charlie. It's like there's another principle, the crown can do no wrong. That's a rule that's very easy to misunderstand. If you live in France, again, never mind if you live in Russia, there's a rule that the interest of state override ordinary legal protections. And so the crown can do no wrong in the sense there that acts of the king are inherently legal. But in England, it's exactly the opposite. The crown in England is incapable of giving an illegal order. And therefore, no illegal order from the king has any binding force on anybody. And anybody who does something that is against the law because the king told them to is thoroughly answerable in court for what they have done. The maxim in England is that the king is literally incapable of ordering someone to commit a crime for reasons of state or for any other reason. And what is extraordinary about that is that this rule is actually operative from well before Magna Carta. When we get to Magna Carta in 1215, we are not seeing innovation. We are not seeing people who said, good heavens, the king is a tyrant, let's fix that, let's get some rights. What Magna Carta is doing is saying that of all William the Conqueror's successors, the most odious by far is King John, a dishonest, treacherous, weak, violent, cowardly, sneaky man. And we are going to make him seal a document that lists all our traditional rights because he doesn't seem likely to respect them if we don't do that. And that's an extraordinary thing to do. The, the rights protected under Magna Carta, some specific ones we'll get to in a moment, but they are part of this common law that I was talking about. And the common law, under the reign of Henry II, Alfred is the only king in English history is known as the Great. But Henry II is the almost great. Henry II is the really pretty good. And Henry, who's John's father, one of the great things that he does, that all the Angevins are great administrators, whatever else they may be, is that he creates a functioning system of royal courts that go around the country and they dispense justice. People prefer the king's courts to the baronial courts because the king's courts are fairer and they're accessible. You don't have to follow the king around. Somebody did try to figure out what Henry did in one typical year of his reign, which included a lot of France, by the way. He seems to have traveled about 2,000 miles on horseback, which you know would take an iron derriere to do. And if you're on foot, you're never going to manage to keep up with it. 
but you don't need to follow the king to get justice. His courts will come to you. And when they do, they get local people to take a solemn oath to tell them what the rules are and what the facts are. So they determine the law by asking local people what is the law. This is how the law arises as a detailed procedural matter from the consent of the people. It's not judge-made law. It's true that judges are writing down the law and they create these, these roles that get carried around and precedent. But the, what the judges are doing is not saying, well, I think it should be this. I'm the great chief justice. The judges are asking the ordinary inhabitants of England, what is the rule? And this is how the common law is made by the people. This is popular sovereignty, not just as some abstract theory. This is not Rousseau ranting. This is an actual legal process that works in England. And the thing about no right without a remedy is that what makes the common law work is this exceptionally detailed system of writs that any wrong that you have suffered, any right that you have been denied, there is a particular thing you can go and get a legal paper saying, so-and-so claims you have trespassed on his land, so-and-so claims you have stolen his horse, so-and-so claims you have imprisoned him without cause. You are hereby ordered to appear in court and answer these charges, and if you don't show up with a plausible defense, we are going to believe what he said. And these are rights against your fellows. These are rights against the powerful. These are rights against the state, habeas corpus. Right? This writ that says you have his body. That is not his corpse, but he physically is in your hands. You need to come to court and say why you arrested him. And if you cannot give me a good reason for that, we are going to arrest you. Because if this is not a legal arrest, you're a kidnapper. And so this exceptional throughout the 13th and 14th century, this amazingly elaborate system of writs of laws, so that any wrong, any uh, tort against your property rights, actually there is a specific, detailed, working way that you can try to get it fixed. Now, the system of writs eventually ossifies, it becomes too complicated, and it leads to uh, such a nightmare that eventually you get this sort of bleak house jarndice and jarndice kind of lawsuit. Eventually, in the 19th century, uh, there's a great simplification of these writs on the theory that many of these particular wrongs fit into general categories. And I think this on the whole is a good thing. You also get the so-called courts of equity, because sometimes the specific legal rules are so tangled up that the Chancellor of the Exchequer just creates a court that says, never mind all that, rhubarb. What is fair in this case? But again, it draws upon these fundamental principles of the common law that whatever is not forbidden is permitted, and force and fraud are forbidden. And therefore, you will find, for instance, in Edward Cook in his accounts, many memorable attempts to work through important rulings and explain the principles. There's one where somebody sets up a pig farm next to somebody else, and the person who's so offended by the smell of the pig, which apparently are not uh, fragrant, that he claims essentially that there's an act of trespass going on, and the court ponders this and takes a deep whiff and goes, yikes, you better get those pigs out of there, buddy, they really stink. And you see that the person's property, his ability to use and enjoy his property, including not staggering around choking from the stench of pig manure, has been violated, and therefore uh, he has a legal remedy. He can force the guy to remove his pigs. Uh, at one point, uh, Parliament has to give the uh, exchequer a, a kick. The system starts to ossify, and Parliament actually orders them to give writs when there's clearly a wrong, invent a new writ. Uh, and that, that brings new life into the system into the 14th century. <clears throat> but all of this, until the moment where I just said Parliament there, is happening without a legislature. So when you're asking, why is all this happening? Well, one of the reasons that it's happening is that people understand that this is how it ought to be. And the other reason is, going back to the we can carry arms now that the legions have left, is that the people of England in particular take this stuff seriously in practice and will stand up for it if it is threatened. Hence Magna Carta. Magna Carta does not result from a conference. Magna Carta does not result from a petition. Magna Carta results from an armed uprising that is going to put either John's seal or his blood all over the parchment of Magna Carta. Now as soon as John seals Magna Carta, he sneaks off and tries to raise an army uh, to defy his, to break his promises. Whoops, wait, 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 w
And that is why, by the way, on the cover here, that's Rochester Castle. John besieged Rochester Castle while he was trying to break his word about Magna Carta, but failed to take it despite <coughs> tunneling underneath and greasing the timbers with the fat of 40 pigs and setting it on fire. Um, so the whole thing was, was very much about an armed uprising of people who would not see their liberty trampled. And you must never forget the Genghis problem. If you're not willing to fight for your rights, the chances are someone else will be willing to fight to take them away, and that will be it for you. But Magna Carta is signed in 12, sealed actually, in 1215. And Winston Churchill, as late as 1956, called it one of the fundamental documents um, <coughs> that became a, the, the doctrine for national state, when in subsequent ages the state, swollen with its own authority, has attempted to ride roughshod over the rights or liberties of the subject. It is to this doctrine that appeal has again and again been made, and never as yet without success. As late as the reign of Charles I, Edward Cook will remind Parliament and warn the king, Magna Carta is such a fellow as he will have no sovereign. That is to say, the rights of Magna Carta cannot be overridden by a legislature. The American doctrine of a constitution emanating from the people that overrules statutes is important from Britain. At the time of Edward Cook, this is how Englishmen understand their liberties. Uh, by the way, the BBC had a poll in 2006 looking for a proposed Britain Day, and the winner was June 15th, the date the original Magna Carta was sealed. So this is not completely lost in the popular mind. It be D Day, B E Day, and Remembrance Day. And Magna Carta, when you read cynical historians, of whom we have perhaps an oversupply in this world, they will tell you that Magna Carta is an aristocratic document, that it was for the barons and the rich men, and somehow eventually it trickled on down. One writer says it was originally a series of concessions to the baronial families in the church, with some benefits for merchants, townsmen, and the lesser aristocracy. The implication being that Edward Cook twisted it into a document for everybody. And uh, again, there are other sources of this, but this is not right. Magna Carta is confirmed dozens of times by the monarchs succeeding King John, including by the hapless, though long lived Henry III. And when he confirms it, he confirms it to the barons, priors, earls, who probably were among the longest of rich people in that time, and to all the free men of this our realm, the liberties following to be kept in our kingdom of England forever. All the free men of our realm, this turns up again and again and again in confirmations of Magna Carta. Magna Carta is for everybody. So what does it say? Well, looky here. This is Clause 28 of the original. 1215. No constable or other bailiff of ours shall take the corn or other chattels of anyone except he straightway give money for them or can be allowed a respite in that regard by the will of the seller. Now, corn here is not the, the stuff you pop for watching a movie. Corn meant all grain, and it included the yellow stuff is still on the other side of the Atlantic waiting for Columbus to sail over. And on the way, by the way, uh, he ate iguana and declared that it tasted like chicken. So he would quickly stop saying things taste like chicken. Okay, Columbus got there, he said it, we're done. But this is the this is the takings clause right here. No taking of property without just and timely compensation. It's in Magna Carta. And with the system of writs, this can be enforced. I think this is quite an extraordinary uh, thing to find so early on. And Magna Carta, by the way, was read in all the cathedrals of England twice a year. So everybody would know what it said. It is for everyone in England. This is not about the barons. It doesn't say the chattels of any noble, besides the noble might be able to fight back, of anyone, except he straight away get money for them. Not, yeah, you should find you some script, we'll redeem it in the reign of the next king, but three, straight away. Now, that's all fine and good, but what? You know, anybody can make a promise. But here's another clause, clause 39. No free man, no free man, not no noble, not no bishop, not nobody important, his cousin is in court, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any other way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do him except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. And the or there at the last means or by the... Um, 
So it, it's an inclusive. You can't do either. It's not one or the other. Even both must be respected. So this promises due process. We've got a takings clause in the original Magna Carta. We've got a due process clause in the original Magna Carta. And again, all of these are confirmations of the traditional liberties of the English. None of this is seen as an innovation. They didn't like innovations. John was the innovator. And they weren't going to let it happen. These are the ancient liberties of Englishmen. And what else we got here? This one to me is amazing. Again, this is in the first Magna Carta, Clause 12. Scootage, my spell checker doesn't like, by the way. But um, <laughs> aid is, basically scootage or aid means taxation. No scootage or aid may be levied in our kingdom without its general consent, except it's very specific, the ransom of our person, to make our eldest son a knight, and once, to marry our eldest daughter. Because John is such a snake, he'll marry his daughter off six times to raise money if you don't put that in there. His brother, Richard the Lionheart, I don't know what he likes Richard, he was worse probably than John. He kept getting ransomed for one thing. Richard once said he'd sell London if he could find a buyer. However, you'll notice that aids from the city of London are to be treated similarly, so no sneaky sell in London. John's the sort of guy who might actually do that. His, one of his hobbies was starving people to death. He killed his own nephew in a drunken rage. Um, he was truly an appalling character. But the general consent, there's a phrase that's easy not to focus on. But as I said, I say again, there's no parliament. Parliament has yet to appear. What are they talking about? They're talking about the notion that from time immemorial, the community's consent has been necessary for taxation. It has been necessary in the sense that you can only do it in the traditional way and in traditional amounts. All of this is in Magna Carta. And as Paul Johnson would write about the subsequent history of England, all revolts against the king were in the strict sense reactionary, including Magna Carta. Revolts always look backwards. There's an example during the American Revolution. There's an obscure battle somewhere in Maine, whose name always escapes me, where the leader of the, of the rebels says to the people, to preserve your ancient liberties, rally to the cause of the revolution. And the British commander, figuring he could use a little help in the tight spot, says, to preserve your ancient liberties, rally to the crown. Everybody's agreeing that it's about preserving these ancient liberties. They're just bickering about who's going to do it. And frankly, I think the revolutionaries had the better of that argument, at least in America, over King George III. But they're all arguing about this. And I think this is amazing. And what is amazing about it is not only that they say it, but that it works. Uh, I have a, a common example. The, the Code of Hammurabi, which does deserve a brief tip of the hat, because it is the first really codified law anywhere. Uh, if you actually read it though, it's completely blood curling the stuff that happens. If you, if you curse your father, various parts of you shall be ripped from your body forthwith. But this is how the Code of Hammurabi begins with this particular declaration uh, that Anu and Bella called Hammurabi by name to rule over the black-headed people and enlighten the land to further the well-being of mankind. It's, almost everybody talks like this. I don't care how dreadful a tyrant is, they'll tell you they're doing it for the good of the common people. And it then goes on at the end to say that if any of his successors change his laws, a bevy of dreadful Babylonian gods will do all sorts of really appalling things to you. Um, but this is just talk. Right? Hammurabi does not, in fact, deliver justice of a sort that we would recognize. He does not deliver good government. And when his successors do change the text, Shemesh does not deprive them of water in this world or the next, nor does Nergal cut off their limbs and smash them like earthen images, nor does Ninkarak cause to come upon their limbs high fevers and severe wounds that cannot be cured. It says it, but it doesn't mean it. I looked up Nergal online, by the way, and found this. Apparently, Nurgle has come down in the world. He's now a Polish shock rocker. Um, I don't know if it's better or worse to be a Marvel comic character. At least if you're Thor, you get to smile occasionally. I don't think Nurgle smiles very much. But the point here is that in focusing on English law, you need to think not only about how remarkably it coincides with our sense of how things ought to be, but how, in fact, it operates that what is in the Code of Hammurabi might as well be on the dark side of the moon for all the good it does anybody, except the really bloodthirsty parts, which probably happened a lot. But Magna Carta, they mean it. This is another clause of Magna Carta, by the way, one which increasingly haunts my dreams. To no one will be sell, to no one deny or delay right or justice. If you look at a modern legal system, 
I think one of the promises of Magna Carta that is violated is this one. Because justice is too expensive and too time-consuming. We're not surprised today to hear that somebody has been sentenced to a year in jail for a crime they committed eight years ago with a discount for time served. And what if they were found innocent? How can you be dragged through a court for seven years, bankrupt, and then told, oh, <laughs> our bad? This is not real justice, but English justice in the time of King John was swift and not in the sense of simply being arbitrary. They didn't just not bother to find out. They got it done and they got out of Dodge. Now, the selling of justice in that case was a little more direct, you know, don't hand the judge money. But the idea that unless you are a millionaire, you should flee from a lawyer's office as though Ebola was rampant in the reception room, is, in my view, a very serious defect in the legal system and something which we ought to be going back to if we want to have rights that don't really exist on paper, but exist in fact. You have to be a super ornery character or super rich, and probably you have to be both, to be willing to contemplate legal proceedings, especially against the state, because the state has infinite resources and a, an aversion to admitting error which Hammurabi would envy. Now there's another aspect, I think, of the effectiveness of the protection of property rights in the time of King John that deserves attention, especially because of what has subsequently, in my view, gone wrong. And that is that, well, I said that the Angevans were good administrators, and evidently they were. Even John, his enemies would not deny that he was a hard-working man who was capable of keeping track of a lot of details in his head. But there were no telephones, there was no email, there was no Skype. There were, everything had to be written on rolls of parchment and then carried about on a horse. There was a limit to what the state could try to do to you, for you, or in any other way. You had to make it count. A parchment, by the way, made from the skin of farm animals. Some of you may know the word palimpsest, a lovely word meaning a manuscript where something is written on it, something else had been scraped off. They were into recycling in the Middle Ages and other of its splendid qualities. Because you only get about four good leaves of parchment for a given animal. So it would take two to three hundred sheep or calves to get enough parchment for a single Bible. There aren't memos in the time of King John, and there certainly aren't forms. And some of the kinds of petty harassment of, to which we are endlessly subjected nowadays would have been beyond the administrative capacity of any state, whether that of the English or of my favorite counterexample, Russia. That's Ivan the Terrible, great name for a ruler, thank you very much. Uh, none of the, neither of them could have imposed upon you the sorts of stifling regulations under which we live constantly today because the administrative capacity wasn't there even if the will had been. It's one of the reasons that punishments in those days tended to be severe. You couldn't go after everybody, so you had to put the fear of God into them. And if you couldn't put the fear of God into them, you had to put the fear of sharp iron. Um, in uh, 1125, uh, King Henry was so upset with counterfeiting that he gave the order that every counterfeiter should lose each of them the right hand and their testicles beneath. You know, again, th this is where, where you, if you think of criminals as rational actors and they measure the likelihood of being caught by the severity of punishment, if you feel that the likelihood of being caught is relatively low, you have to up the severity of punishment. And none of you are going to forget that part of this speech, even if the rest of it pours out the other ear as soon as I stop talking. And uh, there was an example that uh, Brian Lee Crowley is all too familiar with because it happened to me while I was working for him, and I think I may possibly have alluded to the matter occasionally in the office, about uh, having a, a small renovation done in a very small cottage. And the incredible, petty, bureaucratic harassment of being accused at one point of having encroached on Crown Lake bed because a rock that I couldn't have moved with construction equipment was now the little three-inch channel between it and the shore had had some debris fall into it. And I had to dig out this channel and then email a photograph of it to the local conservation authority so that they would actually give us an occupancy permit. And at one point, we had an inspector show up and a uh, completely useless character refusing to help land the boat or anything. And when he got to the cottage, he was meant to be inspecting the new part at the back, and he got up on the sun deck at the front, which had been there since... Uh, 
I don't know, 1975 or something, and he whipped out his tape measure and he said, this really is an inch too low. It must be raised. It's 41 inches, 42 or bust. I said, look, buddy, what do you care? You're not going to fall off it. In fact, when we bought the place, there were no uprights. So I put in upright railings, but they left a little gap between the cap rail and the upright because the cap rail was kind of high. Sitting in a chair, it was hard to see the leg, so I left a gap because that's no good. You have, it's got to run all the way up. And I said, well, why? We measured this. Nobody could stick their head through there. Not even the most active and dim child you've ever met. It's too narrow. Don't care. So we have to tell the contractor, stop what you're doing, tear out the railings I put in, before which was just a gap, put in railings that go all the way up, and raise the cap rail one inch. So they pry off the cap rail, slice one inch slices off a of six by six or four by four, put them on top, nail them on, put the cap rail back on. It's weaker now because there are these stupid little one inch slices. Nobody is safer. It's nobody's business but mine. If I choose to plunge from my sun deck haplessly, I regard this as my outlook, right? My body, my sun deck, blah, blah, blah. But the state feels that 41 inches is an affront to man and God, and 42 inches is fine, and they can now administratively enforce such a regulation. I'm not saying John wouldn't have happily done it if he could have, though I think his concerns lay elsewhere. But he couldn't do it, and neither could Ivan the Terrible. Ivan the Terrible could burn your cottage down, Ivan the Terrible could make you a serf, but Ivan the Terrible couldn't mess with your railings. He didn't have the administrative capability. And that is an important part, I think, of the story, that a state that means to do good, whether well-conceived or not, is now simply in a position to do things to you that none of them could. Now, uh, Ivan the, the Terrible, by the way, one of the interesting things about Ivan the Terrible is that he generates the first law code-like object in Russia. And uh, it's a pretty dreadful document. Um, but what really matters about it is not what it says, but that it doesn't operate. That Russians do not acquire the rights put in the law code just because Ivan the Terrible said they should. At one point, Ivan the Terrible divides his kingdom into an outer and inner part, and he rules the inner part with a secret police force whose emblems are a wolf's head and a broom. And I don't think you need to know all the details to feel that this is a distinctly sinister development. And obviously, it doesn't matter what the Russian law code says. If the wolf and the broom come for you, you're swept up, chomped down, or both. Um, and then, after the time of troubles, the, you get the, uh, the Romanovs, and they go, hey, wow, I wonder what the law of Russia actually is. We don't know. We've got Ivan's law code, but we've been issuing ukases and decrees and so on, and they're scattered across the chaotic bureaucracy that we possess here. So they try to draw together a new law code, and they basically write to people and say, have you got any laws lying around? You know, so obviously, how are you going to get courts to enforce a law that not even the Tsar remembers that his predecessor sent, and maybe it came from the false Boris or who knows what? But when they do put cobble together a new law code uh, in the in 1649, serfdom has appeared. It now exists, it is now regulated by law, but it was never created. That, to me, is the essence of lawlessness. That you could be usurped without a rule, it's bad enough watching slavery appear in the United States, painful, detailed, legal step by painful, legal, detailed step. At one point, for instance, Virginia specifies that slaves are subject to real estate law. So they're telling slaves, you are dirt, literally. You are actually legally dirt. But at least if the law must say you're a slave, the law could say you're not a slave. But in Russia, you could serve them without there actually being a law. And then they don't bother updating it between 1648 and 1830. So that's a kind of lawlessness we do not live under, and be grateful for that. We have in this country, I think, some pretty bad laws, but we do have the rule of law. We are not subject to invasion or insurrection. We are not subject to massive disorder. And for the most part, what the law says is what happens. So if you can change the law, you can change the situation on the ground. And this is a great blessing. Do not let the whining, which I intend to engage in from here on out, conceal this point. This is a good thing. This is a very good thing, and it's an historically rare thing. Now, obviously, it's not done without effort. Kings of England make persistent efforts to overturn this system. And a lot of the story of liberty is this battle on a high level to constrain the king. Um, Henry VIII, who I think is a particularly terrifying character, and, and who is known to tell the Speaker of the House of Commons, either you pass my bill or I am going to kill you, and nobody laughed. This was not an ice-breaking jest. This was literally the business of the government. At one point, he wants to have a law that says that 
His pronouncements have the force of law. Richard II tried this, by the way. Richard II once said, the law is in my mouth. He was promptly deposed and murdered in prison. So Henry VIII goes to Parliament and says, I want a law that says that my statements have the force of law. And Parliament responds with a very short piece of legislation that says, sure, by all means, here you go, shoot. No, you don't. So the king may, for the time being, with the advice of his council or the more part of it, set forth proclamations under such penalties and pains as to him and them shall seem necessary, which shall be observed as though they were made by an act of Parliament. Now you see it, but read the next clause. But this shall not be prejudicial to any person's inheritance, offices, liberties, goods, chattels, or life. Now you don't. So the king can do anything that doesn't change traditional law, but he can't infringe on anybody's liberties. And when Henry gets extra frisky and decides, say, to break with Rome, seize the monasteries, that sort of thing, he must always go through Parliament. It simply fails. And notice shackles. There it is again. Property. And, once again, it's not just a bunch of words on a piece of paper. It's actually true. And then you've got the stewards who try to govern without Parliament, a story everybody once knew, uh, you know, James I, Charles I, and all of that, but you just get the Glorious Revolution, you get this Bill of Rights, a model for the American one, so it's too small to read, and I know that I'm running short of time here. And then, of course, when the Americans have their revolution, they put property rights into their constitution. No shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation due process of law. All of this Magna Carta is still there. And it's all following what William Pitt said in 1760. The poorest man made in his cottage bid defiance to all the force of the crown. Or, yeah, here it is. Um, it may be frail, its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the rain may enter, the storm may enter, but the king of England may not enter. All his forces dare not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. And this was true in England, and when it wasn't true in the United States, the Americans rebelled and they put a stop to it. And though we're sometimes told that this is not true in Canada, that is a, that is a misrepresentation. Again, Daniel Cannon talks about the loyalists. Don't think of them as big government Tories. They left because they thought that America was too democratic and would become socialist, that property would be trampled. As one of these, Daniel Bliss, who was from Massachusetts and was later Chief Justice of New Brunswick, said, better to live under one tyrant a thousand miles away than a thousand tyrants one mile away. <laughs> when the judge ordered two rebels hanged in 1837, he said, you live in a country where every man who obeys the law is secure in the protection of life, liberty, and property. The phrase Jefferson didn't quite put in the Declaration of Independence, in hanging the rebels, a uh, judge in Upper Canada does say it. And Joseph Howe, when in 1835 he urges a jury to acquit him of libel on the grounds that his criticism of the corrupt administrators was true, British law said truth is not a defense. But Howe said, you are free people, you live under laws of your own making, this is appalling. Will you permit the sacred fire of liberty brought by your fathers from the venerable temples of Britain to be quenched and trodden out on the simple altars your ancestors have raised? And he says, if not, I will go somewhere else until the principles of British liberty and British law have become more generally diffused. So this notion that the principle of liberty is backed by effective law is dominant in Canada as well as in Britain. The problem is we've lost sight of what property is meant to be at the same time that the state has acquired this capacity to nibble us to death, or not perhaps to death, but the growth of the economy is so great that the more they steal, the more we create. But to, to put us under a degree of harassment in everything, from signing a contract, opening a business, anything you want to do now is subject to regulations beyond belief. Try building a fence in your backyard and see how many rules there are that do not give you the right to do anything you want with your property, provided it's not manifestly a pig farm level nuisance to your neighbors. And yet, this, I put the source on this one because it's so amazing, Canada signed this. Everyone has the right to own property alone as well as in association with others, which by the way is because civil law is not so clear on that, I think. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his property. And it was meant to go in the Charter. This was in Trudeau's draft of the Charter. Everyone has the right to the use and enjoyment of property, individually or in association with others, and the right not to be deprived of those. That would have covered all these regulatory things. And uh, they had to tell the provinces, it doesn't mean we can't have public interest regulation, but you get compensation if you do. And part of the problem is that our understanding of property has shriveled to the point that we think of it as selfish, that we think that it is in conflict with that high-minded thing called public use. 
The old rule said, of course, sometimes takings are necessary for all kinds of well understood reasons. Transaction costs hold up free riders. But the way you balance the public against the private interest is the state has to pay for it. And if it's not worth paying for, obviously the state was making it up. They were claiming greater benefits than would really have arisen, and they're minimizing the cost to you. But the other problem is that. The government is now in a detailed position, as this is happening, to regulate in a way it never could regulate before, to deprive us of property a little bit at a time while saying, look, you still own it. Nothing bad has happened to you. We'll hear more about this, I think, later. Uh, but this kind of notion, and it's much more pronounced here than in the United States, that restrictions on use of property are not a taking, provided you still own it. This is exactly wrong. If the government builds a pig farm and you cannot breathe on your property, the fact that you still formally own it does not mean you have not been deprived of what is rightfully yours. But you see here this long arc, a concept that I think exists in every society, that what I make with my own time and effort is mine, provided I have not been dishonest or violent in the process. Being protected by law, actually coming to exist, that noble promises are in the law code, and you, the citizen, have remedies that mean you get what it says. And there's a long rising arc. But you do that in your medical comparison I was talking about. You think about the Sherlock Holmes stories. Watson casually slips a revolver into his pocket. You are secure in the possession of your property, including the right to defend it. Victorian England has an amazing degree of liberty under law. And then in the last hundred years, Losing sight of the notion that self-ownership is a positive good, not a painful concession to the greed and selfishness of a mass of citizens with money. And the growing capacity of the administrative state, in the name of the public good, to do whatever it likes and not have to compensate you because it says, but this is in the public interest. What are you, a meanie? These have converged to produce a rapid deterioration in our security and property. We're not, as I say, we're not under Genghis land. We are not under Ivan the Terrible. We, are, we live in a peaceful society, well defended. We also have law that mostly means what it says. I noticed that the um, Ontario government was just explaining why it made this loan to that medical hub in Toronto. They set up this fancy building that didn't fill with researchers, and they weren't allowed to lend it money, but their excuse was it was a unique situation. That kind of reasoning, if followed any great distance, becomes extremely dangerous, but we're not there yet. The problem is we've lost sight of why self-ownership is good at precisely the time that the state has acquired an unprecedented capability to annoy us in small things. So the glass is half full, but we need to fill it again by reminding ourselves of why in the first place property is good and what the long struggle to protect it consisted of. How you do in practice what you want to do in theory. If we can do that, my little summary about we had it, we didn't have it, then we got it, then we didn't have it, can end happily with, but we got it back.